Chapter 1, The Emergence of COVID-19. In this course, we'll be discussing the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we discuss the COVID-19 pandemic, let's take a trip back in time and discuss the first pandemic of the 21st century, SARS. 16 years before the COVID-19 pandemic, the world was facing another deadly pandemic. On February 21st, 2003, a Chinese doctor named Liu Jianlun flew to Hong Kong, China. He planned to attend a wedding and he checked into room 911 of the Metropole Hotel. The next day, he became ill and was admitted to a hospital. Only two weeks later, Dr. Liu was dead. On his deathbed, Liu told doctors that he was recently treating patients in the Guangdong province of China for a deadly respiratory illness. The Chinese government made a brief mention of this to the World Health Organization, but it concluded that the likely culprit was a common bacterial infection. By the time anyone had realized the severity of the disease, it was already too late. On February 26th, a woman checked out of the Metropole, traveled back to Toronto, Canada, and died. She had brought the disease with her, and she inadvertently caused an outbreak in Toronto. Consider that it took four years for the Black Death which killed over a third of all Europeans in the 14th century to travel from Constantinople to Kiev, or that HIV took two decades to travel the globe. In contrast, enabled by widespread international flights, the new disease had crossed the Pacific Ocean within a week of when it was introduced in Hong Kong in 2003. As health officials braced for the impact of a fast-traveling outbreak, panic set in. Businesses were closed, sick passengers were removed from airplanes, and Chinese officials were threatening to execute patients who were infected but were violating the quarantine. International travel may have helped the disease spread rapidly, but international collaboration would eventually help to contain it. In a matter of weeks, biologists had found the virus that had caused the epidemic, and they successfully sequenced its genome. In the process, the mysterious new disease earned a new name, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS. We reminded you about the SARS outbreak of 2003 because the scientists of the COVID-19 pandemic are facing many of the same questions as did the ones of the SARS outbreak of 2003. How did SARS-CoV-2 cross the species barrier to humans? When and where did this happen? How did COVID-19 spread around the world? And who infected whom? Now that we remember the SARS pandemic of the early 2000s, let's travel back to 2019 to Wuhan Central Hospital. On December 30th, 2019, Dr. Li Wenying of the Wuhan Central Hospital received a report of a suspected SARS patient. He shared the report with friends, and the news about a deadly new SARS outbreak quickly spread throughout China and the world. Immediately afterwards, the Wuhan police summoned him for spreading comments about a false SARS outbreak. Indeed, it was not SARS. It was something much worse. Lee would go on to contract the actual disease, COVID-19, from a patient, and he died on February 7, 2020, at the young age of 33. Well before his death, the first COVID-19 victim would be reported. A regular customer at the Wuhan wet market, a known location for selling exotic animals like bats and snakes. Since the first COVID-19 patients were traders at this market, doctors thought they may have contracted it from the animals. On January 23rd, the Chinese government placed Wuhan and nearby cities in a quarantine that encompassed 50 million people. The United States government would restrict travel from China on January 31st, but it was too late. COVID-19 was already circulating all around the world. The first COVID-19 death in the U.S. was registered on February 29th. By September 1st, 2020, COVID-19 had taken over 700,000 lives worldwide. What exactly does the SARS pandemic of 2003 have to do with the COVID-19 pandemic? To answer this question, we have to look much closer at both viruses. The virus that causes SARS belongs to a family of viruses known as coronaviruses, which get their name from the Latin word corona because the virus particles resemble the corona of the sun. Before SARS, no one believed that a coronavirus could wreak such havoc. Known coronaviruses only caused minor problems like the common cold. The coronaviruses SARS-CoV-1, which causes SARS, and SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, are indeed related. Their genomes are similar, and they both originated from bats. They also have similar proteins on their exteriors, and they use the same receptors on the surfaces of human cells to invade. 
However, although both SARS and COVID-19 are caused by similar coronaviruses, the diseases themselves are very different. SARS turned out to be much more lethal than COVID-19. On average, 10% of people who were infected with SARS died. And SARS patients started showing symptoms within days after infection. With COVID-19, however, many patients don't show symptoms for a matter of one or two weeks. Another key difference is that there were no asymptomatic SARS patients. This made contact tracing, or finding out who infected whom, much easier than it is in the COVID-19 pandemic. SARS would go on to infect only 8,000 people around the world, and the pandemic was done within five months of when Dr. Liu checked into the Metropole Hotel. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is here for the long haul. It spreads much faster and often without symptoms, causing each infected person to infect potentially many others. SARS vaccine studies were started in mice and other animals. However, because the virus quickly disappeared, SARS vaccine development was discontinued. In hindsight, this was probably a mistake, as SARS vaccine development surely would have helped solve many of the challenges that the current COVID-19 vaccine developers are facing today. Not only that, but if SARS-CoV-1 was able to jump from animals to humans once, who's to say that it can't happen again? And a SARS vaccine surely would come in handy in that case. It turns out that we can study the molecular sequences of coronaviruses, and we can use these sequences to try to infer the evolutionary history. Coronaviruses, influenza viruses, and HIV are all RNA viruses, meaning their genetic code is stored as RNA, or ribonucleic acid, instead of DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid. This is important because RNA replication has a much higher error rate than does DNA replication, meaning RNA viruses are capable of mutating much more quickly than our DNA viruses. This rapid mutation of RNA viruses explains why we have to have a different flu vaccine each year and why HIV is so hard to combat. SARS researchers initially hypothesized that, like HIV and influenza viruses, SARS-CoV-1 underwent zoonosis. In other words, it jumped from animals to humans. They first named birds as the likely culprit because of similarities between SARS and bird flu, a form of influenza originating in chickens. However, when researchers sequenced the 29,000 nucleotides that make up the SARS-CoV-1 genome, it became evident that SARS could not have come from birds because its genome did not look like the genomes of viruses that came from birds. By fall 2003, researchers had sequenced many SARS-CoV-1 strains from patients all around the world but many questions still remained unanswered. At that time, sequencing a viral genome was still a relatively challenging task. A paper describing the SARS-CoV-1 genome was authored by nearly 50 researchers. 16 years later, with the development of novel sequencing technologies, sequencing SARS-CoV-2 was a relatively simple task. And after SARS-CoV-2 was sequenced, biologists began addressing a spectrum of questions about its genome.